Hello and welcome to Capturing Christianity. I am Cameron Bertuzzi. Today what we're doing is we're talking about a topic that, uh, well, we're talking about hell. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of objections to this doctrine, the Christian view of hell, and uh, that's kind of what we're doing today is we want to, first of all, understand what this doctrine says, and then we want to look at some objections to this view and uh, or, or this doctrine. And so, the person that I've invited to discuss this with is Father James Rooney, and uh, this is his first time on the show. I've seen him on YouTube, uh, a couple other appearances that he's made. He's actually been on Twitter as well, and he, he's been talking about universalism a lot. And it was actually, I was watching a video that he did recently with Pat Flynn. And he was giving some objections to universalism, and this was actually the first time where I was hearing objections to this view, whereas in the past, it's, it's you know, from atheist skeptics and even other Christians, you hear all these objections to the traditional view, but here we're, I was listening to objections to the universalist view, so it was uh, very interesting, very, very interesting stuff. But uh, Dr. Rooney, I'd like to, uh, should I call you father or doctor? Because you, you've got a PhD Whatever in philosophy. You'd like. Whatever you'd like. It does not bother me. Okay, how about I just call you, well, fa I'll call Father you Father. Father J.D. Okay. J.D. or Father J.D. is good. Father J.D., go okay. You. Okay, let's do that then. So, uh, well, let's let's start off the interview. I know you you, you wanted to uh, say a couple things as we get started here, but um, yeah, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself, and then if you'd like to, to say some other things, feel free. Yeah, so I'm Father James Dominic Rooney. I'm a Dominican friar, as you can maybe see. I'm wearing my habit here. Uh, I teach philosophy. I'm a professor of philosophy at Hong Kong Baptist University in their philosophy and religion department. And uh, I work on uh, metaphysics, basically, uh, medieval philosophy, and essentially medieval Chinese philosophy. So I'm, I'm interested in Confucianism, and the medieval version called Neo-Confucianism, Changju Li Shui, the Chung brothers and Zhu Xi. So I wrote a book on that that came out recently called Material Objects in Confucian and Aristotelian Metaphysics. And I'm working on other projects along the same lines. I do some stuff in political philosophy. So I'm working up a book on that, uh, an edited volume with a Jesuit from Munich. Um, so. Anyway, I work on all that sort of stuff, and I just wanted to offer, I know Cameron's channel um, has a lot of people watching who are not Catholic, um, and I just want to point out that this week today is the end of the week of prayer for Christian unity. Today is the feast in Hong Kong, at least, uh, January 25th, the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. Um, so I just wanted to suggest maybe we we offer a prayer for Christian unity. We know that's not God's will for us. We know there are lots of fights among Christians and pain when people convert. And we know that's not what God wants. He doesn't want us Christians fighting each other. So I just wanted to suggest we say a, a quick prayer before we begin. So yeah, my, my prayer is real simple, just a glory be to the Father. Uh, so you can join me if you'd like, camera. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We just ask God to help us all glorify the Trinity together. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, um, let's get into the topic today, which we're talking about uh, the traditional view of hell. So th there's, and we'll talk about some of the competing views of, of hell in a little bit, but what I'd like to do to start out is just ask you, how you became interested in this topic in particular, because, um, well, yeah, let's just, let, let me just put it to you. What, what, what are, how did you get interested in this specific question of this, this doctrine, right? Cause there's, you know, people get interested in all sorts of different doctrines and this one does stick out to certain people. There's a, a guy that I've had on the channel, a bunch Protestant guy, Chris date, and he's a, a well-known conditionalist or your, or an annihilationist. And, uh, just like kind of like him, he's just got a fascination with this topic, this subject. But how did you get into defending the traditional view of hell? And uh, wh why did you go down that path, so to speak? Yeah, so I should say I didn't like get into hell. That wasn't the thing I'm interested <laughs> in. And it still isn't. Um, I've become Father <laughs> Hell. A total accident. Um, my my interest has been for a long time. So I should say my, my views in metaphysics, I work on metaphysics, I work on philosophy of science stuff, 
basically. And one of the things I'm very interested in is free will. So what I work in in political philosophy is also connected to free will. Why free will in political liberties uh, is valuable. So why, why we should have free societies, for instance. So I'm basically interested in problems of free will, like how they work with neuroscience. And another thing I'm interested in with free will is how God causes free actions. So that's, that's something we believe in Christian doctrine happens through grace. We believe God causes everything, of course, right? So he's going to cause the existence of free will. But in grace, in particular, we think God is, God's action is necessary in a miraculous way to bring us to, like, love him, right? We couldn't love him without God doing something special apart from creating us. So the questions that are famous in Christian theology have always been how that works, um, how we're still free if God causes us to do things, to love him. So that's an old problem. It's called the De Auxilis controversy in the Catholic Church because we had a famous debate. There was a congregation on grace, De Auxilis, that was called in the um, uh, that was called and tried to resolve some questions about it, and it left it all open questions. It never resolved the questions um, between the Jesuits and the Dominicans. So I'm interested in the history of that and in the philosophy and theology of how God's grace uh, causes us to do things and we're still free. So I should say I'm working on a book about it, and I've been working on a book for a little while. I started it when I taught in Rome. I taught at the Angelicum, the Pontifical University of St. Thomas in Rome, uh, about two years ago now. I taught there for a year. I'm still a fellow of the Thomistic Institute. I'm a uh, research fellow of the Thomistic Institute in Rome. And so one of the problems that has traditionally been alleged for views, uh, the Dominican views uh, of grace is that they lead it to be the case that uh, God causes people to sin. God causes people to go to hell. So you might just say causing people to sin and causing people to go to hell are just two sides of the same coin because hell is just like the extreme of moral evil. So I have problems with the traditional Dominican position. I think, I mean, if I can put it this way, I think there are problems with the people who have defended it in the past. Uh, and I'm trying to go back to some of those debates about how to understand the Dominican position better. I think the classic Jesuit position is wrong. That's called Molinism, if you've ever heard of it. And the Dominican position has been called Bonesianism. So I've written some things about why I think there are problems with traditional uh, expositions of Bonesianism, specifically those of Garrigou Lagrange, Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, who was a Dominican who taught at Rome. And just as a funny story, I lived in the room down the hall from him when I lived there. So people always joked his ghost would come and choke me in the middle of the night. I had to be careful um, because I was attacking him. I wrote a paper about why I don't like his views. So, Well, yeah, that's that's uh, that's super interesting. I, I am familiar with Molinism. Uh, Dr. William Lane Craig has sort of made that more popular as of late. And uh, I think also Alvin Plantinga, isn't he a Molinist as well? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he uh yeah from the reformed tradition. Anyways, yeah, I'm um, not a fan of these views. I, I I think there's something wrong. So I'm defending the traditional Dominican view, but I'm trying to show that it doesn't uh, entail these bad consequences. So I think some people who defend the Dominican position are what we call compatibilists. So that means they believe causal determinism. God determines everything. Everything is necessary, metaphysically, something like that is compatible with us being free and responsible for sin. So I, I think Garrigou Lagrange uh, is sort of the source of this problem, and I think he made a mistake. So uh, that's what I'm, that's, well, that's well, part can, of what I'm Connect that to the current topic of, of hell. How did that, what's the connection there? Well, the problem is pretty simple. If you think that uh, God causes us to sin and we can't do anything else, then uh, he's going to punish us unjustly, right? Because if we end up in hell and we, didn't, we couldn't have done anything to prevent being in hell, that looks like a problem. That's what people have always said is the problem with Garrigou Lagrange's view. So I'm trying to, uh, this is sort of how I got started, right? I was talking about 
why God's grace is still uh, gives us alternative possibilities, we say. Mm -hmm. So how we are, what we have to do is we do something <laughs> that causes God to deny us grace. God doesn't deny us grace. And then we like, can't do anything else. So that's, that's sort of where I'm going here. And then you might just say hell is the extreme of this possibility. Um, let me just now connect it a little bit to the contemporary debate. So the reason I got into the contemporary debate was David Bentley Hart. So I met him when I was at St. Louis University in 2014 or so. You know, I don't think we ever actually talked about hell at all because he hadn't written his book that all shall be saved when I knew him. Actually, I think I had good conversations about Hinduism with him. He gave me a signed copy of his book, The Beauty of the Infinite. So I, I always had very high admiration for him. Uh, and he wrote this book, uh, That All Shall Be Saved. And ironically, because I think he's a very smart man, I think one of the things that's very interesting about the book is he helped me see that there's a serious problem with these views of hell, uh, the, with, with his views and the connection between the, God's permission of hell and some issues with grace and free will and grace and nature. Uh, in the past, I hadn't really thought about it because I think for most of us, we just think, well, uh, hell is a kind of possibility of our freedom or something like that. Um, we don't, uh, you know, and I thought, well, maybe it's more dogmatic but it turns out, I think you can give a good philosophical proof, uh, as it were, that uh, his view is wrong because of what it requires to be true. And I think he has shown me that uh, it turns out all kinds of his view, all the universalism that's like his involves this kind of implication. And I'll talk about it later. So I, I don't need to say it right up the front here. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting a, a little bit ahead of ourselves. Uh, what I've kind of want to do at the beginning here is just lay out, give us a good concept of what the traditional view of hell looks like. What does it entail? Cause you know, some people think that it's like literal fire in hell and people are like being tortured with sticks and uh, like, you know, fire and, and skin falling off the bone type thing. Like, so what, what is the actual like Christian concept of the, or the traditional view of hell? Yeah, so we have to be careful to distinguish uh, theological theses or imagination from what we are strictly required to believe. And this is always a very helpful thing to do in theology. You stick to the minimum. What are we required to believe? Now, as Catholics and Orthodox, we have a doctrinal authority. So we, you know, have scripture, right, that, that has certain basic things in it. And that's basically what we need to believe, is what is in Scripture. And for us Catholics and Orthodox, we think that there, there are certain things that are defined um, that we can't, uh, we can't reject. So I tend to think that the traditional view of hell consists in what's in the creeds and what the church has defined. So the traditional view of hell is essentially uh, a very simple truth that we can reject God's grace definitively, by our actions. So this truth uh, means that we can stop loving God and potentially keep not loving God forever. So that possibility of being eternally separated from loving God, which is, we might give in Catholic terms, losing sanctifying grace and persisting in mortal sin forever, that's, that's hell, that's it. Um, and the reason it results in punishment and pain, what the punishment and pain is, is because our hearts are naturally made for union with God. That was God's plan for us. And so eternally persisting in sin is its own punishment. It'll cause us pain and suffering to persist in something that's bad for us. That's basically the idea. So God doesn't need to do anything else to cause us to suffer in hell than to allow us to have what we want. So here I think C.S. Lewis was, was entirely correct. He famously gave in The Great Divorce that, that beautiful book. I think it, it captures everything I'm saying and it captures the, the fundamentals of the traditional view of hell when he says the gates of hell are locked from the inside. So um, this, is, this is the core of things. 
And I think it's definitive for a number of reasons for Catholics and Orthodox. It's definitive because it was affirmed by the Second Council of Constantinople. They rejected this apocatastasis view that uh, the pains of hell for all are going to be temporary and everyone's going to get restored, including the devil. So I think it's just the thing that's described in the Gospels. Now, to be careful here, the point of the view is not that there is somebody in hell necessarily, um, any human being. The point of the doctrine is just that it is possible. It is possible. So I don't think there's anything wrong, for example, with somebody like Hansers von Balthasar or Jacques Maritain, who think that maybe everyone's going to go to heaven in the end. All human beings are going to end up in heaven. There's nothing wrong with that view. So in, in the scriptures, in the scriptures, it does say things that indicate Judas is damned, but the church hasn't taken a, a side on that. So in our Catholic doctrine, we don't have the minimum here is not Judas is damned. It might be possible he's saved. We don't know. And I think that's where we should leave it. The Council of Trent says we can't know who's predestined. Uh, we, we can't know we're predestined, I mean, except by special revelation or something. Uh, but basically, we, we don't have any grounds for knowing uh, everyone's going to go to heaven. We don't have any grounds, even, I think, for knowing there are specific human beings in hell. I don't think we have any of that. The last thing I want to say, though, is about the fire you mentioned. So um, the fire, so in the Catholic tradition, we came up with sort of two names for what's going on in the traditional doctrine of hell. So in the traditional doctrine, there are two pains of hell. One is the pain of loss or the worm of conscience. Those are two names for the same thing. And what that is, is what I've just described, that once you reject God's grace, you persist in mortal sin forever you're going to have this pain of conscience. It's going to be a spiritual pain that you've lost God's grace. You're never going to be happy. That's basically the pain of hell. And everybody says, our catechism says, that's the essential pain of hell. There is, though, traditionally a second pain called the pain of sense. And this is, this is I think, also dogmatically defined. But the dogma doesn't say what it is. It just says it's going to be there. So this is the fire. This is the fire. And um, there's, there have been competing interpretations as to what the fire is. So if you look at the Catholic Encyclopedia on hell, you'll find that they talk about two different views of what the fire is. In Catholic theology, we debated it, one of which was it's a material fire. So I think uh, Aquinas thought it was a material fire. He thought it was likely it was a material fire. Uh, many theologians have thought it's a material fire. Uh, what they mean by material fire here is going to be uh, primarily after the resurrection, I would think, the resurrection of the body. Um, now, uh, I think uh, there's a much better case to be made that it's a spiritual fire. Um, so that's actually what I've been sort of proposing, because I think the Eastern tradition gives us a very, very good and helpful way to understand how it's a spiritual fire. Uh, I think it preserves the former claims about hell consisting essentially in separation from God. So let me give you my account. Uh, as I said, it's not, uh, this isn't doctrine of the church. As I said, we just stick to the minimum. The minimum is there's a fire, there's pain of sense. We don't know what it is. So here's my, here's my account of the spiritual fire. God has a never give up policy on any human being. He loves everybody and wants them to be in union with him, even the people in hell. And what happens is Jesus died on the cross to unite us to him, to atone for all sins. He's united himself to humanity, to humanity. So every human being is in a union with Jesus in light of his union with humanity. And his love can never be separated from us. So, right, that's St. Paul. Nothing in heaven or earth will separate us for the love, from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So there's nothing we can do to stop God from loving us and from being united to our, our physical bodies, to our human nature. So this is exactly what's going to happen at the end of time. Christ will raise all from the dead. That includes the sinners, right? The people who are damned. All those in the afterlife and after the resurrection will, quote, every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. 
So in the afterlife, here's what I think happens. God raises us to new bodies, and everybody, without exception, is granted a certain knowledge of God's love for them. God recreates them, makes them immortal, restores their, their spiritual faculties to a perfect state, their intellect and will. And that love will cause those who have a defect in their will, people who are opposed to God, who hate him or don't love him, they'll be pained by that, exactly as St. Paul says. So you might think of it like this. Job says, in my flesh, I will see my Redeemer. The damned are going to see the Redeemer too. Uh, they won't have the beatific vision, which occurs in their, in their soul, right? The kind of intuitive vision of God's essence. They won't have that. But they'll have some knowledge of God that comes from seeing Christ, right? And from, from seeing him in a spiritual way, in resurrected bodies. They'll have knowledge of God. And they'll be tormented by that because they hate the God they see. And it makes them sad. Now, I think that what Christ does is good for everyone. So St. Isaac of Nineveh, who's an Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, character, a Syrian, I mean, I shouldn't say an Eastern Orthodox, Eastern saint from Syria, and Maximus the Confessor, both give kind of accounts like this. They say, Jesus is going to unite himself to everybody, and it's the same thing he does for everybody that is just being received in two ways. So the people in heaven will be made happy by knowledge of God, and people who are opposed to Jesus will be made sad by it. So this is why I think you can preserve the claim that the essential pain of hell is that pain of loss, and that what God does here is not like intentionally torment people in hell. He's not like doing something extra to make them feel bad. He's doing the same thing which is good for everybody, but it causes some people pain accidentally. It's no part of what God's doing to cause them pain, but it uh, causes them pain because of purely because of them. So I think this is the best way to understand the fire. Yeah, I find it interesting you say that uh, hell, the traditional view of hell, is really just the possibility of it being eternal for any individual person. So we can only know, is, is that, I'm trying to formulate the, the question that I want to ask you on, on this, because you said that we can't actually know if anyone, even including like, say Judas, like, we don't even know if he is is in hell. Is the criteria that for someone to be in hell means that they're there forever? Is that the criteria? Is that how is that how we would know? Um, I mean, what I mean by no is there's no philosophical a priori thing we can know that's going to show us some people have to be in hell. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason that like God has to have people in hell. We know God could save everybody, right? Um, we know there's no reason on the side of human beings, right? Because they're free and God has given them grace to be saved. So we know there's no, there's no necessity on the side of human beings for being in hell. So this is this first part here, these two things, I'm rejecting Calvinism. <laughs> so uh, Calvin seemed to think that some people needed to be in hell for God's plans to be accomplished. I just think that's silly. I think that's, that's, that's a hateful image of God. So we're not talking about that here. Um, but uh, I also think in terms of revelation, we don't have any revealed. That's the only way we'd be able to know it. We can't just look at somebody and find out they're in hell, even Hitler, because we'd have to know for certain that until the last moment of their life, they never repented. They never repented. And repentance is inside, right? We can't always tell whether maybe at the last moment Hitler had some movement of, of love for God and said, oh, geez, you know, maybe as the bullet was flying through the air right right into his brain in suicide. I mean, even though it's, it's unlikely, uh, I think, it, it's not impossible. It's not impossible as Hitler was dying. He had some movement of love for God. And that's all you need to go to heaven. That's all you need to go to heaven. It's necessary and sufficient to go to heaven that you have living faith in God, that you you love him, you believe in him, that's it. So we can't know if somebody had that from, from sense evidence. We can't see that happen in anybody. And it's not in the Bible. We don't have any revealed data as to who is going to hell or not. So um, we don't have any revealed data, even Judas is going to hell, some people think. And the church hasn't said 
that the things that are said about Judas require that he's in hell. So they look bad, but some people have interpreted what's said in a way that could be compatible with Judas repenting. So that's all I'm saying. We don't have any way to know anybody's in hell, and the church hasn't defined that the things that are said in scripture require us to believe Judas is in hell. So we stick to the minimum. We stick to the minimum. I want to kind of jump around. I sent you a list of questions that I wanted to ask today, but I kind of want to jump around a little bit and skip down to the last one, which is about postmortem opportunity. Do you, can Catholics affirm postmortem opportunity or is it just like at the moment of death? That's it. There is no such thing as postmortem opportunity or someone can, you know, be, be given another postmortem opportunity just means someone is given another chance after they die here on earth to embrace the love of God. Yeah, so I mean, I think this is another case of of minimum. <laughs> um, we have to be careful about what the church actually teaches. And, you know, I understand lots of people don't believe what the Catholic Church teaches. So I try not to, to hit on things that are unique to Catholic teaching. So I think we Catholics do have definitive teaching that people are judged immediately after they die. We call this the particular judgment. So there have been dogmatic doctrinal affirmations uh, by the papal magisterium that that occurs. So I think for Catholic theologians, it's not really plausible to say that this is the case. But let me just let me just uh, be a little careful here. Uh, we want to be a little bit more. Why uh, uh, there might be good reasons to believe that that occurs uh, independently. So I think there are good sort of metaphysical reasons to believe there's a there's there's a reason why people aren't going to change after they die. I'm going to leave that aside. I don't think it matters very much. We just focus on the essentials. So what's the essential here? So I know you jumped ahead, but I need to be a little careful here to lay out a difference between two different views. So the two views that I'm attacking, uh, I'm only attacking one of these two views. So in the contemporary debate, people are talking about universalism. Universalism is the belief all will be saved. Every human being is going to go to heaven. So it comes in two flavors, though. So the first view that I've already mentioned uh, implicitly is what we sometimes call soft or contingent universalism. This is the view that it could be the case everyone goes to heaven. Now, as you've noticed, what I've actually said in terms of the doctrinal minimum says that's a perfectly acceptable option. It could be the case. It could be the case that everyone goes to heaven, but it's not necessarily the case. There's nothing that makes it impossible for people to go to hell. There's some metaphysical possibility. There's some chance that people go to hell. So as long as there's some metaphysical possibility that people go to hell, uh, and it's contingent, right, that people go to, everyone goes to heaven, then it's not doctrinally problematic, I think. Um, on the other hand, there are people who believe that it is literally impossible. There is some strict reason it would be incompatible with God being good to even allow the possibility of anybody going to hell. So that is the view that I think is, is wrong and is seriously wrong. So um, this, is, this then gets us a helpful way to think about this issue about postmortem opportunity. So... The first thing to say is for Catholics, we do think, and the Orthodox, I should say, we do think that after you die, uh, it's not, so to speak, heaven or hell and you're done. There is a kind of intermediate state called purgatory. It ends by the time of the general final judgment. But we believe that um, God gives everybody, excuse me, God gives people opportunities to be saved. And some people can accept those in a kind of, uh, we might say they have some love of God in their hearts. For example, in my case of Hitler repenting right as, as he shoots himself, if he like thinks, oh, maybe this is a bad idea right after he pulls the trigger. I mean, I think people don't die right away uh, when, they, when they shoot themselves even. Uh, there's some possibility there. And then after they die, maybe there's some slight time where they can repent. I don't know. And I don't think we have to know. 
We think, though, as Catholics, there's a certain way in which after people die, um, they can grow. Uh, they can grow in a certain kind of way. Their uh, debt of sin is worked off. Their, their charity increases in a kind of intensity uh, until it makes, makes up for all the inclinations they had toward evil that they still have in their hearts. So if Hitler did repent, he would have to spend a long time in purgatory, is what I'm saying. And there's a way in which that is a kind of post-mortem opportunity for conversion. It requires something here, that we have to do it here. And maybe, you know, like in that window of time when you're not quite really dead yet, right? Maybe there's some time there when you can repent. Um, but I mean, I think that's a kind of way of thinking about what a post-mortem opportunity is. But on the other side, um, I don't think there's post-mortem opportunities after you're really dead. And there's certainly no post-mortem opportunities after the general judgment. Um, I think every Christian should say that. There's no opportunities after the general judgment. Um, it's it's going to have to end sometime. God doesn't have to give us infinite time, infinite opportunities to repent in that sense. Um, I think at the new heaven and new earth, it's, it's, it's over. But you don't need to think about any of that. You just need to focus on what we're saying here, which is what is an opportunity? An opportunity is the ability or the, um, right, the power or the possibility of things having been otherwise. So for everybody in hell, it will be true first that they don't have to be there. <laughs> and it will certainly be true in a certain way that God doesn't stop loving them and that they have a certain kind of standing opportunity for conversion. This is what I said earlier, the gates of hell are closed from the inside. I think C.S. Lewis made a very clear, imaginative kind of illustration of what we mean. In The Great Divorce, somebody who looks like Jesus is driving a bus tour that goes between heaven and hell, and people from hell can get on the bus and go right to heaven. That, I think, is basically the case. The only reason people don't get on the bus is because they don't want to. Or even if they get on the bus, they go to heaven and they come back. They don't want to stay in heaven. So I think God never closes his heart to us. Um, I think that's, in that sense, there's, there's certainly an opportunity that continues forever. But an opportunity doesn't mean it's ever taken advantage of. So um, the fact that God offers an opportunity, even if there were post-mortem conversion possibilities, doesn't mean that anybody actually takes advantage of them, or certainly that all take advantage of it. So what you have to argue to get to that position, hell is necessarily impossible, you have to think something like the possibility being offered makes it impossible for people not to take advantage of it. But that looks like a logical problem. I mean, that's just not true. It doesn't follow. You, you, yeah, you... Uh... You've said a lot of things, and I'm trying to focus in on this question of postmortem opportunity. It's because it, it's it almost sounds like it's in conflict with the the Great Divorce to me. So the the Great Divorce, and I'm kind of again we we like skipped down to to the bottom of uh, the questions that I had planned to ask you. So um, I'm trying to decide if we should lay some more groundwork before we do this. Um, let, let's do that. Let's, let's get, let's get back on track here and kind of lay out some more options that Christians are currently debating. And then we'll, we'll kind of roll through the list, uh, sort of systematically as, as we sh should. And so let's, let's get back to, um, you already mentioned universalism. We've talked about tr the traditional view of hell, uh, and, and your particular account that you think is the, the best way to, to understand it. So let's now, uh, talk about, briefly, uh, annihilationism, because this is a view that I was actually le leaning toward before I became convinced of Catholicism. So uh, is this something that you've really put much focus or emphasis on? Have you mainly been focusing on universalism? I have been focusing on universalism, but that is, if I can put it this way, annihilationism, I think, is not a very serious option myself. Um, now, I haven't, I haven't argued against it, in print or on Twitter or anything too much. I just don't think it's a very serious option. Um, there are a few different reasons for that. Uh, there are different varieties of annihilationism, but let me just say, annihilationism seems to me to be motivated by two mistakes. 
One mistake is uh, thinking of sin uh, as like literally nothing or as making us nothing. So there's, there's a kind of uh, theologian, I think it's Paul Griffiths, who had a view like this, that like, if God allows us to continue in sin, we'll just eventually cease to exist. Um, I think that's a kind of mistake by mistaking what sin is. Sin is a lack of something, right? It's a lack of due order in our will, right? We're not loving what we ought to love. And in that sense, evil is nothing. But that doesn't mean we're literally nothing, <laughs> right, uh, when we sin. Uh, so I don't think that that's quite right. And I think also there's a kind of problem in thinking of what, what's going on in annihilationism that seems to miss things about God's providence. So, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, God wouldn't have made our souls immortal if he wanted some of them to cease existing at some point in time. God doesn't need to sort of correct himself like that. So uh, it looks like there's a problem with the view. Um, it either is going to deny something like our souls are immortal by their nature, uh, or it's going to deny something else. But I mean, like, here's something that doesn't make any sense. God makes a soul immortal by nature that he, he causes to, to, to go out of existence. This looks like a sort of God wasn't, <laughs> uh, God didn't know what he was doing at the beginning. Um, why would he create somebody that's immortal uh, and only to make them go out of existence. I could go into that a little bit more, but I just want to give the basic thought. Sure. Um, and yeah, I think the last, yeah, I would I, give I was one more. Say that, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll let you uh, come come back to that. But I, I was just going to say that uh, annihilationists, they also go by the name, is that the right way to say it? Conditional immortality is uh, a, a, like another way of, of describing the view conditional. So, so they think that immortality is conditional. It's conditional on sort of God holding this person in existence. Yeah, I mean, the, but uh, it's if you want to put it this way, I think like, uh, let me think of how to put it a little bit more obviously. I think it doesn't, here's, here's a similar case. Um, here's why I think it doesn't make any sense for God to damn everybody or to damn people on a deterministic model like Calvinism, which is what I would say, God damning people for no reason. I think it's the same reason annihilationism is wrong. So uh, yes, we depend on God for everything that we are at every moment. That's true. God could annihilate us. But God is also in control of what natures he made, right? So if God makes something that by its nature is immortal, that's not going to cease to exist, uh, right? I think there's something weird about creating people like that if he wants to later destroy them. So you can think of this case. I think it actually, you can argue, God can't or won't damn literally everybody. Um, the reason would be, why would he create them in the first place <laughs> uh, as free creatures? And the same thing with God creating people uh, who are free and then damning them for no reason having to do with their freedom. I think it would make God unreasonable because God's action would not be like... Uh, why would he create them as free creatures and then damn them for nothing that has to do with their with their free actions? God doesn't need to correct himself like that. I mean, it would be a kind of correcting himself, right, and the natures he made. The same reason you might say God damning people for no reason seems unreasonable because he creates people with free will, right, if you think people are free. Uh, and... Uh, uh, if he were to impose punishment that has nothing to do with what they've done or is not properly connected with what they've done, God looks unjust, right? Um, so it looks in the same way annihilationism looks unjust. God would be destroying somebody uh, for doing something that uh, doesn't, doesn't merit it, right? Um, you might also think uh, a different way to put the point might be um, uh, this is what I think looks wrong with Calvinism. You think, uh, well, God creates people, let's say we're not really free, where all of our actions are determined. Well, it looks weird to, uh, if our actions are actually determined like that, uh, you know, compatibilism is true or something, or causal, total causal determinism is true, grace is irresistible. Well, why would that require eternal punishment, right? Um, that looks weird. Um, it looks like God is being unreasonable in what he's doing. So I, I tend to think annihilationism, if I can put it this way, 
has a lot to do with Calvinistic assumptions about people being determined. Um, because if you think people are determined and like their resistance to God isn't really their fault, uh, then it kind of does make sense that um, people should just uh, be annihilated rather than continue in existence. But here's why I think that's a problem, if I can put it this way. Um, I think God loves everybody. And God didn't bring people into existence just to see them uh, uh, be destroyed and even, I think, eternally tormented. So I think there's a way in which one of the things I've said before is I think this moniker, eternal conscious torment, is a bad moniker for the traditional doctrine of hell. Because the point of the traditional doctrine of hell is that God loves everybody and he never gives up on people. So if people continue forever in sin, it's not his fault and he still loves them. So you can say it this way, annihilationism is the same intuition that leads to like euthanasia, right? Um, that at a certain point, people are just unlovable, are just unlovable. And their, their lives are just not worth living in the total sense, right? God doesn't have any reason to love somebody in hell, so he should just let them go out of existence. This is what I've said is, I think, wrong. In my, in my article about hard universalism and cre grace and creaturely freedom, I said, I think this is wrong. I think what happens in heaven is God continues to love people and try to do the best for them as far as he can. So I think that's a much better view of heaven than annihilationism. Annihilationism is like a kind of uh, euthanasia, right? If I can defend annihilationists a little bit, they the ones that I know of, there's a, a couple that I can just name, Chris Date and then Glenn Peoples, uh, they, I've, I've actually learned a whole lot from from their work. They've got a, a great website, RethinkingHell.com, if you guys are interested. But uh, the thing that, that really stuck out to me when I was researching this topic, and that's that's really the, the extent of my research in, into this topic, has been in annihilationism. But what really struck me is that they've got a litany of biblical arguments for annihilationism. So I haven't really seen them argue philosophically for the view I haven't seen them argue from like Calvinistic assumptions to these different or to, to annihilationism. What I've seen is they, they'll take the, the sort of traditional proof texts like uh, from Revelation and in Matthew and, and there's uh, they, they'll interpret it in a different way and say, actually, this supports the annihilationist view. So uh, the, the arguments, the main arguments that I've seen that annihilationists put forward are biblical arguments. They're not like these philosophical arguments. I, I just wanted to kind of put that out there because I know that we've got uh, a good number of annihilationists that are going to be watching this and probably even end up responding to it. So uh, I did want to kind of defend them in that way. Yeah, let me respond to that. So what I'm saying is not that they're making a philosophical argument uh, necessarily, right? I mean, universalists don't tend to present their view in these abstract things that I've said, these arguments I've been giving. Um, but what I'm pointing out is something that I think is a very helpful way to think about some of these issues of scriptural interpretation in general. So universalists do the same thing. They take scripture passages and they give a reading of them that looks consistent with what they say in such a way that they support universalism. So for example, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, right? Or uh, Jesus Christ will be all in all, or these kind of things, right? Um, I think the same is true of annihilationism. They take biblical passages, obviously, and interpret them as supporting their conclusion. However, here's the difference. Uh, I mean, right, people who believe the traditional orthodox doctrine also think the views are based on scripture, right? I just said earlier, I think it's just scriptural. And uh, in fact, um, the thing you notice is that it's their interpretations that depend on certain kinds of assumptions they're making that I don't think are actually, you might say, in scripture. Uh, or uh, another way we could put it is the way you come to what's the right interpretation of any particular passage is by looking about how it coheres with the whole, how it coheres with the whole. So this is a good hint for like thinking about heresy in general. Heretics of every time and place have always argued that their view is the view of scripture, like the Arians. And they had consistent interpretations of all these passages in scripture, like in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. 
they gave an alternative interpretation of those passages that looked consistent. The problem with these views is not that they can't give a consistent interpretation of certain passages or that they take a, a start from a certain passage. For example, universalists always like to use 1 Timothy, right? God wills that all be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Now, notice what that passage says. It says all God wills all to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. It doesn't say God wills all to be saved such that they can't do anything else but be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. So you have to sort of add something into the passage, a certain interpretation. And the way I argue against these views, like annihilationism, is by arguing that the full interpretation of these passages with other passages in scripture uh, undermines the, the coherence of scripture as a whole. So this is how people argued against, for example, Arianism, is they said, right, if you think Jesus is not really the same as God, right, he's not, he's not God the Father in the sense of being the same person as God the Father, but he's the same God in being consubstantial or of the same essence as God the Father. Because if you don't say that, this is St. Athanasius's argument, by the way, if you don't say that, uh, it turns out Jesus isn't going to be able to save us like the Bible thinks he is. So uh, that's a problem, right? Because if you interpret those passages consistently as Arians, it's going to just undermine everything in the Christian story. Now, to give you a parallel, I think that's exactly what's wrong with universalism. It's They can give certain kinds of interpretations of passages that look consistent, but if you think about what they're saying, it's going to undermine the whole gospel account of salvation, particularly the cross. So here's a quick reason why that's the case. Adam in, in Genesis, right, and in Christian tradition, is explicitly portrayed as being given grace to, to do what was right, to accept God, to, to, to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He was created in a state that, that what he did was free and responsible, and God gave him all the help he needed. But Adam was, was allowed to reject that help, was allowed to do something wrong. And the Christian tradition in, implies, says very clearly, that the rejection of grace when, God, when Adam sinned, it wasn't because God failed to give him something. Adam had all he needed to avoid, to avoid sin. And Christian tradition says when he sinned, he lost grace for himself and all his descendants so that everyone would have been dead in their sins. We would still be in our sins. Uh, if Jesus had not come and died for us. So that's St. Athanasius's On the Incarnation and others account of why the cross was necessary. We would have been unable to find our way back to God if God hadn't come for us. So uh, you might notice, though, that in that story, uh, separation from God by your own actions, not because of what God denied you, is actual. That's what the story is telling us happened with Adam, and Christian tradition says with Satan, right? God didn't deny something to Satan. That's not why Satan sinned. He did it of his own free will. But when he did it, he lost grace for himself and, and is unable to come back, Satan. Adam would have been unable to come back without the cross. So I think that this is the basic way to think about these passages with like annihilationism or universalism or anything is how does it fit with our picture of God and the gospel story and what we know to be true. I think universalism undermines the cross, makes the Christian story senseless um, in exactly the way that Pelagius uh, undermined the gospel story. So Pelagius got in trouble for exactly the same problem. He said, Jesus didn't die for us because we were separated from God uh, by our sins. We still had free will, Pelagius thought, and we could on our own reconcile to God uh, by our free will. Um, he said that's why Jesus died for us, was just to give us a good example. <laughs> um, so I think annihilationism runs into a similar problem. Well, we, we've kind of been dancing around the next question that I've got on my list to, to ask you, which is basically just why do you think that the traditional view of hell is the correct view? And so what you can do, uh, you've already talked about some of your reasons against annihilationism. 
what you haven't done really, you kind of spelled out the two different views of uh, universalism, which is super helpful. You've got the sort of contingent view where it's possible that everyone can be saved, which you said is perfectly consistent with the traditional view actually. But then the more, uh, what's the term? The, the harsher view or the harder hard view, universalism. hard universalism, hard universalism, yeah. hard universalism. Uh, that view that says that necessarily everyone's going to be saved. Why, why don't you spend, uh, you know, uh, 60 to 90 seconds on just to some, try to be, yeah, try to be succinct on, on why you think that that view is false. And if people would like to learn more, let me point you to Pat Flynn's interview that he did. Cause uh, I think it's about an hour and a half long and, and they talked about that particular subject the whole time. So maybe just give us a, a summary here. And then if people are interested, they can go and, and seek out that interview. I have three articles on it, so you can read those. <laughs> um, basically, uh, there are only two ways in which it would be true that um, everyone is necessarily saved. Either it's because of something about God's nature, or it's about something about our nature. Um, so uh, basically, you have to think either God can't deny grace to everybody such that they can resist it. God has to give us grace. And what I mean by has to here is just metaphysical impossibility. It is somehow impossible, given what God is, for him to fail uh, or for him to um, allow us to resist grace by our own actions. There, there's something about God's nature that makes that impossible. Or there's something about our nature that makes it impossible for us to, to fail to love God. So um, these are the only two ways to do it and logically speaking. And the reason they're wrong <laughs> is because they both involve something at the deep level, what I'd call an essential relation between God's nature and ours. So this is why I think I've mentioned David Bentley Hart before. I think he's a smart man. I think his view just like accepts the full implications of this and makes it very clear why I think it's wrong. And the basic idea is either God has to like create us and redeem us. God, God can't literally can't do anything else. God from eternity uh, has only one option, uh, or, or uh, human beings just could not exist what it is to be a human being. If God chooses to create human beings, what it is to be a human being is to share in God's nature. That's what grace is. When we're talking about what it is to be saved, we're talking about sharing in God's nature. To be in a state of grace is to share in God's nature. Uh, and the same is true on the other side. If human beings cannot not love God, then, uh, and what I mean by love of God here is supernatural love of God, the kind of love that you have from grace, then what both of these things mean is either God can't exist without us, God can't be God without allowing us to share in his nature, without making us share in his nature, without some connection between us and him, or we, what we are, is essentially somehow divine, right? Because participation in grace is, is, is what grace is. Participation in God's nature is grace. So if that were essential to us, like a human being could not exist, except uh, by being in that state of grace, having God's nature, that's just to say we're divine. We're God. Um, so either way, you're going to get a real problem. Um, the one from God's side, I think, is the harder to see for a lot of people. But basically what it means is a kind of pantheism or panentheism where we're going to have some relation to God that's not just God creating us and we're a distinct thing from him, but there's a necessary connection between God's nature and ours in God's nature. So we're like parts of God or something. Um, so that's the only way in which hell could really be strictly speaking impossible. Um, you can think something like this, God might not have a good reason to allow anybody to resist him, but that's a very hard case to make, I think, because it seems like the only way in which it would be strictly impossible is what I just outlined. Uh, what you then are saying is you can't think of any reason, you can't imagine a good that God would bring from allowing people to resist his grace by their free actions. Um, but I don't think you can prove that it's impossible that way, unless you have this kind of, the, the things I've mentioned earlier. 
All right, so now what I'd like to do is turn to discussing some common or popular objections to the traditional view of hell. And one of them, I mean, you hear it a lot. I've heard it. I think I encountered it very early on in my apologetics career. I mean, if you wanted to call it a career back then, this is this is a an objection that it's, it's, it can actually be put forward very simply. And it just goes like this. God cannot punish someone infinitely for a finite crime. So if someone sends even someone like Hitler, they, I mean, Hitler, as we all know, did horrible, 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 horrible things. But the, uh, the objection here is that even someone like Hitler, like say after like a billion years, like his punishment would come to an end and the things that he did here. So like infinite punishment seems like the wrong amount of punishment for these finite crimes. I mean, the things that we've done on earth. They are not infinite crimes. They're finite. Anyways, what, what are your thoughts on this objection? Yeah, so I think it uh, relies on a legalistic theory of punishment that I, I would reject. So this kind of theory of punishment is one where you might say punishment is extrinsic to what you do and who you are, right? So the idea is something like, right, you do something <laughs> and God has a list of like, uh, that's the appropriate punishment for the crime. Mm -hmm. But what I've said earlier already shows us why there's something wrong with that. Because God doesn't even need to do that, right? God isn't a judge like a human judge, right? So he just has to set up the world in a certain way that vice doing evil is its own punishment. So in my case, what I'm, what I'm thinking is this. This is, this is the right way to think about it, is not to think of punishment legalistically. God's judgment, God's punishment is not like that. And it isn't in the Bible either, by the way, right? God, when he allows, when it says he hates somebody or punishes somebody, it says he allows them to continue in what they're doing, right? He allows them to continue without his help. He allows them to do bad things. Uh, he doesn't save them from, from some consequence of their actions. That's how he punishes the people of Israel. He allows them, he, he withdraws his miraculous help to protect them from the nations around them. So in the same way, uh, the punishment of hell is like this. It's to let somebody want something uh, that's bad for them. So, so to say that uh, God would be unjust by allowing somebody to do this, uh, fight, you know, infinite punishment for finite crime, I think is just the wrong perspective. Uh, all it is to say that God punishes them is he allows them to continue to want what they want. God doesn't have to fix does, it doesn't have to intervene to force them to do something. Um, so as long as we can love something that is not God, as long as we can love something that's not God and not want God, uh, we're not his friends, then, um, right, we, we can do that forever. Uh, if we can do that forever or indefinitely, then it looks like God doesn't have to make us uh, do anything, right? Uh, it's just what we want. God's just letting us do what we want. I, I've given the example from the parable of the prodigal son, right? Uh, God, the father, the, fa the father in the story is not unloving by failing to chain the son to the bed, right? Um, God can, you, you can understand the way in which God, the father is loving because he, he, he gives the son everything he needs to live a good life. The inheritance, he gives him all that stuff, right? But the guy leaves anyway. And God the Father is watching for him, right? He's, he's there the whole time. He knows what that person is doing. God the Father is closer to us than the Father in the parable. The moment we turn to him and ask him, he'll help us. But he's not unloving for allowing the son to leave. Um, so I think that's the sort of the idea here, right? You don't have to think of finite, infinite, right? That's a kind of external uh, legalistic way of thinking about punishment that I think we should just deny. Well, maybe the objection could be altered. So uh, the idea is that someone could go on wanting to rebel or, or to remain and, and do their own thing, kind of is the way that you put it. Um, but what if someone wanted to change and wanted to love God? But if they're in hell, the Catholic view is, is once you get there, you can't get out. Uh, is that is that correct? Do I have that part? Correct? Well, you see, that's sort of, if I can put it this way, that's already what I've been denying, is that okay. people who are, I mean, 
uh, this is what I keep saying by the gates of hell being locked from the inside. I think you might say you're just thinking about it kind of wrong, about how they can't get out. So the reason they can't get out is because they don't want to. Uh, I think God continually gives them the opportunity to, to leave hell. And in fact, that's what I'm arguing is the fire of hell, is, mm. is the possibility of leaving. And it torments them because they don't want to. They recognize it would be sort of good for them, but they don't want to. They never, they never really want to. Um, so uh, I think it's that internal division in people, because their hearts are made for God, that causes them pain forever. So um, if I can put it this way, all you just have to think is it, to say it's unjust for God to punish them, it, it, it translated into reality means something like uh, it would be unjust for God to allow them to have what they want. God has to force them to love him at some point. Uh, God has to set it up so that they would necessarily, given enough time, come back to him. But as I already said, the problem is wh where does that necessity come from? Where does that necessity come from? Um, I think it's going to have to be on our side or God's side. But let me, let me say, if you don't think there's a necessity here, a strict metaphysical necessity, what you should think is something like this. I don't deny this. I think God has to have a good reason out of love of people, out of love of people, to allow them to do something like this. So that's where I argue, I think Jesus's cross, I think what God is doing for the people in hell, uh, he harrowed hell. He broke the gates of hell. That's why they're only there by their own free will. Um, I think this fact uh, actually makes hell, uh, the people in hell, better off than if God hadn't done that. So um, that's one thing I could say. I've, I've, I've used this image that the people in hell are still part of, you might say, God's plan and the, the, the full glorified body of Christ at the end of time. They're like a wound in his heart. And I think it doesn't torment God or the people in heaven that they still care for them. I think they look at them, if I can put it this way, my speculative imaginative case is the people in hell are like people in a nursing home that don't know, don't want what's good for them. So I worked in a nursing home and we had people like this who got like crazy and paranoid and thought the nurses were trying to hurt them. And so this is my image of, of hell in the, in, the, in the afterlife is that um, God and the people in heaven love the people in hell and want to be with them forever. They recognize them as good, as beautiful, uh, despite everything they've done. And they, they're trying to do good for those people, and the people in hell don't want it. They're like paranoid and confused uh, because of their own decisions, right? That's their will. It's not involuntary like the people in a nursing home who have mental deterioration. But um, I think, in fact, uh, I'll even add one more fun thing for you. So Jacques Maritain, uh, a famous Catholic philosopher, Thomist, had a cool um, claim about that. He said, maybe it's possible, even though those people in hell never get grace, never get the beatific vision, they still have the possibility for natural knowledge of God, like the people we say are in limbo, like the unbaptized infants. That's the classic, classic theory. It's not a, a dogma or anything about limbo. Uh, but it's often been said the unbaptized babies uh, go to a place after they die where they experience perfect natural happiness. They never had grace. Um, so they're not punished. They're not damned or anything. But they, they're united to Christ somehow uh, in the afterlife uh, through natural happiness. Uh, Jacques Maritain said, well, maybe the people in hell uh, have, they've lost grace. They have the pain of conscience. But maybe there's some way that the pain of sense uh, can help them find uh, the natural happiness uh, can help repair them in some ways. Uh, they could recognize that being with the people in, in the afterlife is good for them. The people they loved uh, are still there. So I, I don't know if that's a good answer. It's very, very, very speculative. But I just mean something like this, right? You know, you don't have to think that hell is, is pitchforks. Uh, you can think of something a little bit um, a little bit better because we, we know God still loves the people in hell. That's why they don't cease to exist, right? And the people in heaven are not sad uh, because of the people in hell. Uh, and I think you can make sense of that 
uh, just like uh, right how we work with poor and depressed and despairing people in this life. We still think they're worthwhile. They're made in the image of God. Uh, so I like Mother Teresa had a story. Uh, she gets to St. Peter and St. Peter says, uh, go away. There's no slums in heaven. And she gets angry and she says, well, then I'll bring the slums up here. Uh, and uh, I think that's sort of the same attitude with the people in hell that you might think the people in heaven have. They, they care for them. So make sense of, uh, of two things that I've heard from you tonight. The first thing is uh, people in hell earlier on in the, in the, the show, you said people in hell get there by not repenting. We were talking about Hitler at the time and uh, you said it's possible that Hitler repented, you know, while he was shooting himself. Um, so people get in hell by not repenting. Uh, but then you've also said that people in hell are there and they stay in hell because they want to be there, so to speak. But it sounds mm -hmm. like these are, these are, you've got to have kind of both of these ingredients to have someone in hell. So it's not just that someone fails to repent. It's also that this is the type of person who wants to remain in hell. So the people that are in hell, A, don't repent before they die. And then B, they're the type of person that are, that are never going to want to get out of hell. Is that, yeah, is that so, your view? Uh, so I think both of the things are true, but I think both of the things are true because they're two sides of the same coin. So our view, the way I put it is this, it is necessary and sufficient to be in heaven <laughs> that you love God. And loving God is the same thing as hating sin. It's uh, so when people have talked about justification, you know, being righteous, right? What it is to convert, to repent and all that stuff. Uh, if you read Aquinas or any classical figure, they're going to say something like this. There's one motion of the will from sin, hating sin, turning from sin and turning to God. But that's the same thing. It was illustrated visibly in the old baptismal ritual in, in classical times, where what people had to do is they turned to the east and they renounced Satan, or they turned uh, right toward the north to renounce Satan, and then they turned to God, right, to the altar. Uh, so I think that's, that's a visible illustration that turning to the altar and away from the north direction is the same movement. So uh, not to repent and to want something that's not God are just the same thing. You love something that's not God, and that's, that's why you're not repenting. Whereas on the other side, to repent and to love God are the same thing. So I don't think they're the same thing for this reason. So on the one hand, when you don't repent before you die, in being in that state, that, that is a singular event that occurs. But in the second case, what we're talking about is someone who fails to repent perpetually, infinitely, eternally. Mm. So, and so on the one hand, it, it's not that we've got one coin and th this is the same thing on both, both sides. So on, on the one hand, we've got someone who fails to repent, you know, sometime T right before they die. And then on the other hand, we've got someone who fails to repent, uh, T1, T2, T3, T, T4, all the way down the line. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, make, help me understand this. So I think if I understand correctly, I think your question is not really so much about why not repenting is the same as love. So maybe I've misunderstood. It seems like what you're arguing is something like this. Not repenting uh, is not to form a habit of not repenting or something like that, um, which, which I mean, in one way I agree with, right? You repent once. That doesn't mean you've, you've formed a certain kind of, it depends what we mean by a habit. Um, but I think uh, it is the same thing as what I was saying earlier, just in a different register. So here's what I'd say. So when we say you repent, you, you gain, we say God infuses a virtue into you, the virtue of charity, the virtue of faith, hope, and love and charity. Love of God is charity. So you have a habit of loving God after you repent. I mean, as a result of repentance, at the moment of repentance, uh, that happens. If you don't repent, uh, you never have that habit. You never have that habit. So um, when somebody dies, 
certainly they don't repent. Uh, and I think they become, as it were, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's a certain way they never have the right habit for when God appears to them to receive him. So there was a good, a good homily by John Henry Newman on holiness as a prerequisite for happiness, I think is what it was called in one of his sermons, where he says something like that, right? Um, here's, a, here's a visual image. Uh, so he says, you know, the people, uh, you think of what heaven is like. Heaven is like uh, church. <laughs> heaven is like church. And you take somebody that doesn't like church off the street and you, you lock them in the church building. <laughs> and chain them to the pew, and they're going to be miserable. But why are they miserable? They haven't prepared themselves for it. They don't, they don't care for what's going on. They think that what's going on is boring or stupid or uh, hateful, right? Um, so the way to think about it is like that. The person who didn't repent at the moment of death is somebody who hasn't prepared themselves for what's going to happen after they die. So the way I think of it is like God's going to reveal himself to be perfect love to us. And that love is unimaginably great. It's not something that we can prepare ourselves for by ourselves. It's not something we can, we can you know, uh, be prepared to know what it's like. And it's, it's going to bake you, <laughs> if, you're not, uh, if you're not ready for it. The only way we can be ready for it is, is through grace, right? is through the sacraments. So if you haven't repented, if you haven't loved God, Repentance is love of God. So if you haven't loved God and asked for his help, when that vision happens, right, when that love is made present to you after you die, uh, it's going to bake you. And that's exactly what we think happens to people in purgatory, right? As long as they have some love in their hearts, it's going to bake them. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cause them pain because their hearts are still divided in some way between love of God and something else. Uh, but as long as they have some love in their heart, they've prepared themselves uh, for that, that love. But if somebody hasn't repented, it's going to cause the opposite reaction. If somebody doesn't love God, it's just going to be hateful to them. Uh, and I think this is how you can kind of understand why I don't think people can change after God does that, right? Because once it's hateful and you've got that constant experience of something hateful, right, coming to you, right? I think some universalists have said things like this, right? I wouldn't want to be around a God that permits anybody to go to hell. I would hate him. He'd be an evil God. I would, I would be eternally tormented. I think of exactly that kind of case, right? If God shows himself to you in the afterlife and you understand exactly his love and you hate him, right? Or you're scared of him and terrified, uh, then that experience, you're, you're not going to be able to change, I think. But I mean... Um, I think all you have to say is they're not prepared, right? They're not prepared. Even if you think there's some post-mortem conversion, as I said, you just have to think people don't necessarily do that. That's not the only response you can have to, to seeing God. It could be that as long as God is there, right, you're scared, right? You're not going to change. You're going to be uh, hating him. You're going to be terrified, all those kind of things. Uh, so that's sort of what I think uh, is going on here. Um, you have to be prepared by loving him. Mm. So you said you said as long as you have like someone who is sort of torn between both options, like loving sin, loving God, someone in that situation at the moment of death, is your view that they go to purgatory? Uh, I mean, we have to be a little bit more careful, but yes, uh, to okay. say what that situation is but that's essentially what happens i think a lot of people are in that state i think it's mm -hmm. not an uncommon state well, a lot of us have inclinations towards sin and inclinations to god and they kind of coexist <laughs> right um so uh yeah that's sort of what i think happens to most of okay, us interesting. Is, is experience that. yeah so then um so someone who who goes to hell then would, would they wouldn't be in turmoil they, they would they would be sort of made up in their mind definitively that I don't want God. I want my own way. Well, if I can put it this way, one way to think of this is um, you asked about postmortem conversion. Just think of it this way. Uh, the same thing happens to everybody. Some people change their minds as a result of the experience. Mm -hmm. That's purgatory. The people who change their mind, who leave, that's purgatory. 
the people who just stay scared and resisting and want, you know, who, who don't change, that's, that's, that's what it is to be hell, is to be stuck in that state, not wanting to change. Um, so I think you have to do some of that here, but you don't even need to deny postmortem opportunities to think of mm -hmm. what it's like. That, that's C.S. Lewis's mm -hmm. point. You just you just think that like some people are just not going to change. They're just going to be uh, some people aren't are just not going to react the same way, right? Uh, as long as it's outside of you, nothing can force your will. So that experience of God's love can have two different effects. It just depends on you, right? Mm -hmm. Some people might repent. That's that's purgatory. That's sort of that's sort of what purgatory is like. We we could be more specific, but that's basically the idea. Hmm. So this is this is fascinating to me. So there's um we've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes and we were intending to to turn it over to audience Q&A early much earlier than this. Um and we ha we have had a, f a few super chats that have come in. So we'll we'll get to those and we'll do some more Q&A with the audience. But um I, I apologize. I just find this too fascinating. So um what you just said made me think cuz it it does seem fairly implausible that someone like Hitler would have this radical turnaround and, you know, love, love God right before the moment of his death, such that he's going to be entering into heaven. So that, that seems pretty implausible, possible, very implausible, but was it, what doesn't seem as implausible is the view that everyone goes to purgatory because everyone has been in this situation of feeling sort of conflicted between good and evil. Um, and if not everyone, then, then at least the, say the majority of people that doesn't seem as implausible. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually very optimistic. Let me end with that Christian unity thought. I'm very optimistic about, about lots of people, about their ability to find God. I think God gives everybody sufficient grace. That's dogmatic, by the way, God gives everybody everywhere sufficient grace to be saved. What is necessary and sufficient to be saved is faith and hope and love of God. And you can have that while not being a, a visible Christian. It happens. And by doing those things, you become part of the sacrament of faith, of baptism. Baptism of desire is what we call it. Mm -hmm. And so people before Jesus were saved, people after Jesus are saved that way. It's possible. And I think a lot of people, when we say, look at that person, they're morally good. For example, I, I study Confucianism and, and Chinese right uh, philosophy. I, I think there are certainly moral exemplars in the history of, of China before they knew anything about Jesus, where I think, of course, God was, it looks, it looks plausible to me that God was working with them, trying to give them help and aid to become good people. And we can see in some of what they wrote, I think they were having a relationship with God. So I think a lot of us are in a relationship with God, even people who don't know it, even people, I mean, right, I think it's obviously better for Protestants. I think a lot of them are not committing any sin of heresy or schism. I think they're just as good Christians as I am. Uh, they're in union with God. And I think a lot of people are in that situation. They're just going to be, we have all inclinations to sin, but that's the good news. God has redeemed us, right? We, we, he's, he's united to us, all history, so that all we have to do is turn to him. We don't even need to know his name necessarily, right? Uh, even before Christ, people were able to turn to him. And the church is Catholic or universal because it extends through all ages and peoples and times. It's all those people that you were reunited uh, by faith, hope, and love to God. So we're going to see all those people at the end. That's what I think the good news is. God's, God's love is made available to all people. God's love is made available to all people, even despite our sins, right? Even despite our sins, that we might end up in purgatory for a while. Purgatory is a good place to be. Right, because you're going to find Jesus at the end. All right, let's move on to uh, another objection that I've got in the the notes here, which is um, it, it doesn't make any sense for God to create a creature that He knows will eventually reject Him. It would have been better had God never created that person in the first place. What are your thoughts on this objection? Yeah, um, so I think uh, you have to think of a couple different things here. I, I'm, I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible because I know we don't have time. Um, you have to read some of what I've written elsewhere. Um, I think that the short answer is uh, I don't think God knows what we would do 
in other circumstances. I think God has as good a reason to create anybody uh, because we're free. So I think what you have to say here uh, to, to really affirm this objection is it's going to say God doesn't have any reason to create a free creature uh, that is that is different from him, right? So the, the, the Son of God is a different uh, person from God the Father, and uh, he freely and by nature loves God and can't commit any evil. But anything other than God is a creature and can commit a sin. Even the Blessed Virgin Mary, by what she is, she needs God's grace uh, not to commit sin, to love God. So even for her, it's metaphysically possible for her to, to have committed a sin. Um, it's metaphysically possible. God confirms her in grace, but I think God certainly has a reason to create free creatures. So here's the reason you might think God has a reason to create free creatures, even if he knows some might reject him. You got to go to two different levels. The first is what I just did, this very general level. I think uh, God has a reason to create free creatures uh, because there's certain goods that, that you can't have without creating free creatures. So here's what you can't have without creating free creatures, free relationship with God, loving God. You literally can't have it unless somebody has this, this metaphysical possibility of sin. That's just what it is to be a free creature, is to be the sort of thing that by its own actions can choose to love God. And if you're not God by essence, <laughs> right, um, you're not going to love him necessarily uh, by what you are. So I think that's the first thing. Why does God create free creatures? Because that's the only way he can have this good thing, God, God having a free relationship with people. The second uh, is I think uh, God creates free creatures who can resist him, who, who actually can resist him as opposed to the Blessed Virgin. She could never commit a sin by grace. Uh, but I think God creates free creatures that can because there's some good in it. Uh, and the good I've tried to describe is this good God had in uniting himself to us through the atonement. So I think the cross of Jesus makes clear what that good would be, um, why God creates free creatures that could resist him. Why did he create Adam? So this is the, this is the way to put it. Why did God create Adam so that he could commit original sin? Why did God do that? Well, the classical answer of Athanasius and many church fathers was, because God wanted to, to atone for sins, to unite us to him uh, in a special way that we couldn't do without him. You can't have atonement without sin. So God didn't want us to sin. God didn't make us sin. But uh, he allowed the possibility so that if it were to occur, uh, something, something even better would happen. And as I said, I think the people in hell uh, are better off for God having done that. So what I say is, you know, if God allows hell, it has to be for a good reason that is somehow an expression of his love and mercy that he allowed it. And uh, I think what God allowed can be defeated by what he made possible in Jesus. So the good God, God foresaw that he would bring about in Jesus in the atonement uh, overwhelms, defeats uh, the badness in the possibility of hell. So this is the last thing I'll say on this, just, just to punch it a little bit. All you need to show to show it's, impo it's not impossible for God to permit hell, is you have to show contingent universalism is, is possibly true. Now, what I mean by that is, um, as long as God, imagine the world where God makes everybody go to heaven in the sense of he predestines everybody. It's metaphysically possible for people to sin, but everybody just ends up in heaven by their own free choices. Um, as long as you think God has a good reason to allow a world where it's in this world, it's possible for people to sin, to be separated from God forever, but they never are. Nobody's, nobody's in hell. In this world, I think it makes perfect sense that what God has achieved uh, is, uh, is, is really uh, so good that it overwhelms or defeats the mere possibility of hell. And uh, if that's true, then God could have a good reason for allowing hell to be possible. Okay, let's turn to some Q&A with the audience. We've had, as I mentioned earlier, some super chats that have come in. We'll get through these and then I'll, I'll try to comb the live chat as I can. I, I can't promise to get 
to every single thing that's been sent in today. Uh, we do have quite a number of people watching live. So um, let, let's get through the super chats and we'll see if anyone else wants to send in any other questions. We What we may do is just get through these super chats and then close it out because we've already been going for about 90 minutes. We'll, we'll see how it goes. So this one from Fortunate Talisman, he says, didn't Old Testament saints leave hell technically? Yeah, so what we're talking about there is the uh, what's sometimes called in technical terminology, the limbo of the fathers. Um, so the way to think about this, I think, is uh, it's a visual image that doesn't mean they were literally in hell, but what it is, it is telling, so the, the Old Testament fathers, the way I would understand it is they were in, they were in heaven in a certain way, um, but it's by Jesus that they are let out. It's by his sacrifice that he broke the gates of hell and let everybody out uh, to be in union with God. So whether we think it, it happened at their death, that they went right to heaven, uh, because right Jesus tells that story about the bosom of Abraham, it looks like he's pretty happy. He's not in hell. Um, that was before Jesus died, right? He's telling the story. So um, I think this, though, gets us the idea that I've been trying to push, though, that hell is central to our doctrine precisely because it's about what would have happened had Jesus not died. So that's what that image of God letting people out of hell who died before him, the Old Testament fathers, that's what that image is telling us, is that they would have, they would have been in hell, they would have been stuck and separated from God had God not died for them. So I don't think it tells us that they, they left hell. Um, so one last thing on that. Hell, the term, we have to be careful, all I mean by it is the, is the traditional non-revisionary meaning. I mean eternal punishment. I mean the state of being eternally separated from God. So certainly people who are let out of that of, of some state are not in hell when we mean that term, right? And the same thing people sometimes say who are universalists. We don't deny hell exists. Well, they do, right? According to the normal meaning of the term hell, they, they, they mean there's no such thing as, as an eternal state of separation from God. So the people in the Old Testament who died were not in a state of eternal separation from God. So in the normal meaning of the term hell, they weren't in hell to begin with. That's why we use this term to, to clarify the limbo of the fathers. All right, next one from Mason Thompson. He says, in the Catholic view, why do we remain neutral on whether a soul is in hell, hell or not, but, but have some certainty that those canonized are in heaven? Yeah, I think this is actually a really interesting point, but I, I think it's because uh, we don't want to cause people to despair. So, I mean, I gave this, I wrote, excuse me, I wrote a paper, uh, Hell and the Coherence of Christian Hope in Church Life Journal, where I said, uh, I think it's actually really good. God doesn't tell us anybody goes to hell, but he tells us people go to heaven. Because what he's trying to do is tell us that there's hope. He's trying to get us to trust in him for his own sake. So even this is why I think there's a sort of spiritual issue with, uh, I think there's a spiritual issue on two sides, wanting people to, to be in hell. So there are some traditionalist Catholics and Orthodox who are like, yes, the, the, the vast majority of people are going to hell. And if you don't say that, you, there's something wrong with you, right? <laughs> um, you know, because, because it's, it's tormenting and scary and evil and you've got to play it up. Uh, well, I think there's something spiritually wrong with that. It's a kind of like despair or something. I don't know what's going on there, but I think there's a spiritual problem. Whereas I think the other side, if you if you you know have, if you wouldn't love God, if uh, you knew there was even one person in hell, uh, I think there's something wrong. So I think that what God does is He doesn't really tell us any of that. Uh, he doesn't tell us that. He just um, tells us that there are people in heaven to give us hope, to to help us trust in Himself. And he doesn't, I mean, this is the, the, the good news in a certain way. Hell is possible, yes, but we, we don't know. We don't know. So I think it's, it's an important asymmetry to notice in Catholic practice. We think the church can tell us uh, that people are in heaven, but in fact, it's not within the church's power, really, to tell us anybody is in hell. We don't, we don't discanonize people even when we excommunicate them, <laughs> right? That's supposed to be medicinal. Uh, but uh, the only case we might plausibly have is Judas, and the church just hasn't said anything about it yet. 
Um, so who knows? Maybe the church in the future could teach that. But I think it's it's it, they probably will never do that uh, for the for the same reason that I've just outlined. They want to give us hope. They want to say there's no necessity anyone's in hell. Okay, now let's do a super chat from Caleb Jackson, and I think this is gonna do it for it do it for us tonight. Um, I don't know if you guys have been able to tell, but I'm definitely not on my game. We, we don't normally stream uh, in the evenings, but it's actually in the morning in Hong Kong where Father Rooney is right now. So uh, this is the only time that we could uh, make this happen. But yeah, this will be our last question for, for the stream today. This one's from Caleb Jackson, as I mentioned. Let me see if I can get it on the broadcast. Uh, Thoughts on planting as a view of universalism. Everyone in hell will get out eventually, but God eternally creates so that hell will always be occupied. Yeah, I mean, we have to be careful to distinguish possibilities, right, from reality, right? That's what I tried to be careful about, doctrinal minimums, doctrinal minimums. So the mere, nobody denies, nobody denies it's possible God could save everyone. I mean, I don't, right? So uh, planting is just giving us a certain kind of like uh, thought experiment that's like, okay, maybe this is possible. This is how God saves everyone and there's still some hell. Well, I mean, yeah, okay, but that doesn't mean that uh, God does that, right? I mean, uh, it also doesn't mean that uh, hell is impossible in the sense that I've outlined. So hell being, right, eternal separation from God, that's what we're talking about, right? So the possibility God saves everyone and creates more people to be in hell all the time or something in purgatory, right? I mean, I think this is sort of the, the difficulty with that view. First on that view, hell doesn't exist. It's just a, a sort of vision, right, of uh, how God might save everyone and keep creating new people. But but the basic idea uh, is there's no hell. It doesn't show us that uh, there is no hell, that it's impossible for there to be no hell. It just shows us that there might be some scenarios where God is able to save all and put everyone in purgatory and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, like, I don't deny that. That's not a problem. It doesn't show us that hell is impossible, though, that God couldn't have a good reason to allow hell. Uh, so that's 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 my answer. Yeah, fair fair enough. Um, I think we can just leave it there. Th this has been a lot of fun, um, as fun as one might have discussing this topic. Uh, been been let me let me put it this way: it's been fascinating. It's been really fun to to discuss this with you. I hope you didn't get any like. Uh, bad vibes when I was kind of like, I, I just wanted clarity on some things that you said. So I hope no, that's I, I hope great. challenge me. Go ahead. That's great. I, <laughs> I, you know, I'm a philosopher. I don't get scared when people ask me questions or pose objections. Yeah, good. I think like, yes, that's the right way to do things. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, no, this has been a lot of fun. And, and uh, for those of you that are still watching this, I, I want to know your feedback. I want to know what your comments are on the show. If you've got questions, objections, let me know in the comments. Um, I don't want this to be the last show that we do on this topic. I think it's actually uh, going to be more and more of an issue moving forward because universalism is gaining ground, not just in Christian circles, but also in atheist circles. Uh, philosophically informed atheists, I'll say that, they're, they're starting to uh, say things like, if I were to become a Christian, then I would have to be a universalist and stuff like that. And I think it's important that this is a, a topic that we address uh, every now and then at least. So may, um, I just, if, if you... may I just end uh, end with a thought on that? I think I think there's two things that are really important, which I mentioned in my articles. I think one of the things that's that's important to note here is I think universalism is heretical, and what I mean by that is not that universalism was condemned, even though I think it was, but that I think it undermines the Christian story. So I mean I think it entails something like Pelagianism being true, which I think everyone should agree is wrong, or pantheism kind of views, which I think everyone should agree is wrong. Um, I think, though, spiritually, you also see a problem with it, which I think is is why part of part of what's going on with the with the atheist uh, bandwagon uh, on universalism. So, if you read my Hell and Coherence of Christian Hope, I think the point here is really that uh, our hope is not in hell. So, this is the joke in my book that I'm writing. It's called Not a Hope in Hell, um, and the point of the title is our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in His cross. Um, is the end ch chapter, is why this, this, this grace is good for us, why God's grace is good for us. And I think that there's a, the point at the end here is, is what we do depends on us in a certain way. 
um, in the sense of, right, uh, it's about hope in God for his own sake, trusting in God for his own sake. And I think these kind of spirit, these kind of universalist views are a kind of spiritual uh, despair or presumption on God. Um, and I think there's, they want to say salvation doesn't really depend on me in any way. Um, and uh, I think there's something really bad about that, spiritually speaking. For the sake of clarity, you're talking about hard universalism, right? Yeah. Not soft universalism. Yeah. Although I, I would say, I think even with soft universalism, some of the ways people do it, like I think Hans Urs von Balthasar, I think his view is doctrinally okay, but I think there's... I think it's great and, and fine to hope and pray all are saved. But I think some people use this view as a sort of, um, if I can put it this way, uh, a kind of, they want to give arguments that everyone should be saved because otherwise they wouldn't trust God. Uh, and I think there's something missing there. St. Francis de Sales, in my article, I quote him, had a really good prayer when he struggled with this. And he said, you know, God, I love you. And uh, I, I know you'll always be with me. I don't need to know what's going on in the future. You know, this is John Henry Newman's famous prayer. God, show me just enough light to see one step ahead. I don't need to see the distant scene. I think there's something spiritually good in that. Something spiritually good in that. Well, I have, I actually do have more questions that I'd like to ask you, but we do need to end the stream. Um, maybe what I'll do is we, we can schedule maybe a part two. If you'd like to see Father Rooney back, then let me know in the comments. Uh, we, we could do a part two where it's just, audience Q&A. So just with the audience, they just send in all of your questions, all of your objections to the traditional view of hell, and, and we can answer them in the stream. Um, but as far as the uh, the question that I've got in my mind that I wanted to ask you, uh, I'll do that off air. I'll do it. I'll send you an email or, or a Facebook message and, and we can discuss it that way. Um, but thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you again, Father Rooney, for, for coming on. It, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have you back on to talk about uh, your your alternative to Molinism, because this is actually a topic that uh, we've discussed on the show a few times and uh, even had, who was it, uh, William Hasker on to uh, to discuss open theism. So this is definitely a topic that I think our, our audience would be interested in in having you back on for. So mm -hmm. if you're open to it, we can we can discuss that. But hey, I got time. Awesome. Awesome. What is the event that you've got going on? You're you're about to leave. Uh, is it tomorrow? Uh, yeah. So I have. I'm giving three talks on hell. I'm going to <laughs> uh, tomorrow morning to give the same talk. I have a PowerPoint at our school at Rosary Hill for the Seminary of Hong Kong. I'm giving a talk on Saturday in Macau for the University of Saint Joseph about the same talk topic. Or I mean for our Dominican uh, students at the University of St. Joseph on the same topic. And then on Monday, I'm giving a department research colloquium on the same topic. So a lot of hell for me uh, in the few, <laughs> few days coming up. Wow. Well, God bless you. And uh, thank you so much for your work. Thank you for coming on. And thank you guys for, for watching. So uh, until next time, I'll see you guys in the next Capturing Christianity video. See you later. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?